Hey friends, and welcome back to the Alex Makes VR podcast. In today's episode, I want to talk about the future of VR. That's right. I'm whipping out my crystal ball again, and we're going to talk future trends in VR. If you've got a subject or a question for future episodes, I know we're winding down 2020 at the moment. I might have a cheeky little special series coming up in the run up to Christmas, but please, I always love to hear from you. Let me know if you've got any questions for the show um you can let me know at alex makes vr on instagram or twitter i don't know why i hesitated there it's not as if i've repeated those exact words about a hundred times well technically not a hundred times because this is episode 72 um, anyway um also every single monday when these episodes go live i send out a newsletter with the best tips and tricks from each episode and usually a little bonus um rambling in there as well about things that you can do to create a business or life you love with the immersive industries. If you want to sign up for that, you can do so at alexmakesvr.com. So this episode is in response to a question that longtime listener of the podcast, David Yateman asked, shout out David, thank you for asking this question, because um, I put an Instagram story up asking what subjects I should cover in these episodes running up to Christmas, and David suggested, oh, how about what I think the future trends of VR will be in 2021? And it's funny because when I got that message, I was like, hmm, what do I think the trends will be for 2021? It's not like usually I'm pretty quick, pretty quick off the mark and I just go on my gut instinct. I usually have lots of opinions about lots of things. <laughs> um, but funnily enough, I didn't have like a clear idea when I saw that message, I didn't have like something that popped into my head that go, oh yeah, 100% that'll be a thing next year. Or I don't know, it wasn't quite obvious. And I think that that's probably normal for anyone um, working in this industry this year, because, because of the impact of the pandemic, because of the fact that uh, especially for for me as primarily a 360 filmmaker um, and someone that creates VR work for headsets that are shown in a public space or in an exhibition or a cinema context. This year has been obviously total dog shit <laughs> because all of those opportunities to showcase new VR pieces, all of those opportunities to get to new VR audiences have been taken away. VR has been kind of reduced to the people that um, have bought a headset and have it at home um, or you know, uh, institutions or corporations that that utilise it in-house. And I think because of that, I feel like I've lost touch a little bit with what's happening in the VR industry because all I have to go off is the people that I know who work in this industry, my network, the, the rumblings in the jungle, the, the newsletters that I receive from all the big XR industry folk. So I can kind of keep a pulse on what's been happening this year. But my favourite way of thinking about what's next in terms of VR is always to go directly to the source, to see the reactions on people's faces when they try VR for the first time, to interact with audiences that have nothing to do with this industry and get their feedback on pieces because that, that is how you kind of understand audience behaviour. That's how you understand how the general public is interacting with this technology. And although that's not necessarily the question that David asked, the question was, what are the future trends for 2021? I think, for me personally, I have absolutely no idea because generally I look at trends from the point of view of, well, you know, 90% of audiences that I've shown VR to this year have said X, Y, and Z. Therefore, I think that we're going to see, you know, this kind of experience become really popular or we're going to see, like, if you'd asked me this question pre-pandemic, I probably would have said that this would have been the year that you would have seen a lot more um, independent venues and small kind of spaces investing in a small amount of VR technology so that they could host pop-up events. We would see more of a national rolling out of these VR cinemas um, because the equipment is getting so much more accessible and so 
good with the advent of the Quest 2 coming out. You know, a piece of kit that is incredibly powerful, probably the first sign that we're seeing of a technology that could be mass adopted because it's so compact, it's so high quality, and it's so versatile with what you can do with it that it would make sense for for example, you know, an independent kind of cinema to invest in a few of those headsets because then they could both host 360 cinemas. They could also use it in workshops. They could have it in, you know, the foyer to have some kind of entertainment and like play games on it. They could use it as a room scale art exhibition experience because that headset is so versatile and can do so much. But of course, the pandemic has kind of put a bit of a dampener on things. It's kind of removed... In my own experience, like the way that I engage with people with VR, it's removed all of that. And so therefore, my crystal ball is a little cloudy. And I'm not sure what we're going to see next year. I would hazard a guess that because of Facebook's mass investment in VR. Um, I would expect that the Quest 2 will be a killer this Christmas. I feel like they already had amazing sales when it first went live. I feel like that will continue over Christmas and we will see more and more of a push into the at-home experiences, the gaming side of VR, the social VR platforms. I mean, there's been some incredible advancements in social VR this year, so I can only expect that that will continue next year. I think as events and live entertainment start coming back, we will see um, people adding these digital elements. We will see that there will be virtual options. You know, if a world conference comes back for corporate employees, maybe we're going to see some kind of immersive digital um, way of accessing it so that you don't have to travel to that place in particular, especially because different parts of the world are responding at different kind of rates, um, different speeds, I guess, to the pandemic. So I think we'll see that next year. I think we'll see... um, I d- the thing is, I don't think we're going to see mass advancements in the tech itself, because I feel like the Quest 2 was already a big leap forward in VR in terms of like a, ma- uh, a, a piece of equipment that could be mass adopted. It's interesting, though, because... As I'm recording this, I'm actually just starting to listen to Ready Player Two. Now, for anyone listening that isn't heavily embedded in the VR industry, you might know Ready Player One as the Steven Spielberg movie that came out, uh, I think it was last year or the year before, um, which was based on a book written in, I think it was the early 2000s. I could be wrong about that. But essentially, Ready Player One is like the holy grail of... um, of fiction about virtual reality. Uh, If you've ever heard someone in VR refer to the Oasis, uh, it's a little bit like referring to the Matrix. You know, the Oasis is this uh, this, um, big virtual playground, the virtual world which everyone exists in in the future because we all use our headsets. But it's interesting because I've just started Ready Player Two um, and I'm not going to give anything away about the story, uh, but within the first chapter, it's interesting because they very quickly tell, get, they kind of give you a sense of like what the book's going to be about. And literally within that first couple of chapters, all they're doing is kind of exploring the ethics of brain um, interface VR. So as in, at the moment, and in Ready Player One, um, it was the case that you put on a headset and if you wanted to move in the phys- in the virtual world you had to move in the physical world you know you had these omnidirectional treadmills that you can kind of like walk on which give you the illusion of walking or you might have like a haptic glove so that you can kind of like feel the sensation of touching something but you're using your hands to control things in the virtual environment but you're physically having to do it in the um the real world as well but where i think all of this goes, and this is terrifying to kind of predict, but, and I don't think this is happening in our lifetime, and it's not, it's, it's not happening anytime soon, although Elon Musk <laughs> is definitely trying to make it that way with, with his um, new company, Neuralink. Um, but in Red Play 2, they talk about the ethics of brain-powered VR, 
This idea of putting on a VR headset that connects directly to your kind of like your um, your prefrontal cort cortex or whatever the fancy word is for the part of your brain that controls movement and sensations. Um, and you could be laying down but in the virtual world, a bit like in a dream, it would physically feel like you were doing certain things. If you were running, it would feel like you were running. If you were eating a banana, it would feel like you were eating a banana. It would taste like you were eating a banana. Have you ever had those dreams? Just side note, have you ever had those dreams where you can actually taste something? I had a dream the other night about eating a cookie and it was the first dream where I could actually, I felt like I could taste the cookie. <laughs> And I woke up so kind of mind blown because I was like, that's never happened before. That's so weird. And anyone that's been following me, um, even pre-podcast days, um, will know that I'm like, I love to like think about what the future of VR is. And I love to think about that big picture view. And I'm also a massive uh, proponent of VR for good and how it will, you know, it will take someone that doesn't have necessarily all of their kind of um, motor functions in the real world and be able to give them this new lease of life, whether it's, you know, they've got some kind of um, uh, disability that doesn't allow them to move in, in the real world. All of a sudden, VR offers them this kind of, this, this outlet, this n another way of living. And just think that could be <laughs> even a case of if you couldn't, um, hear or if you couldn't taste or all of these different senses, you could, you could now experience that in this VR world. Anyway, side tangent. And also just, this is, for me, this is the breakthrough, right? Is when you start to think about dreaming, you start to realize that this is not the work of science fiction. Like this could be a reality. As scary as that is, and that's why obviously the ethics of it are, need to be heavily debated. Um, and I don't think this is happening in 2021, get, getting back to the subject of the podcast. But the very fact that when you dream, you do feel like you're moving, you do feel like you're running, you do feel like you're touching things, that proves to you that your brain is already capable of living in that virtual world, in creating this other reality. And so tapping into that with a VR headset is obviously it's possible. <laughs> Again, I don't think it's happening in our lifetime. Um, but it was interesting because in the book, obviously, they're exploring the ethics of that. They're exploring the ethics of whether that kind of technology should be allowed into the world. And it got me thinking about the fact that, you know, this year, more than ever, has shown us the potential of VR. It's shown us what VR is good for and what it could be good for. Imagine all of those kids that couldn't go to school for months and their poor parents had to all of a sudden, you know, juggle their job and be an at-home teacher. Imagine if they had had a headset at home where they could have virtual lessons. Imagine if that was just kind of an option. Oh, little Jimmy's sick and he's, uh, he's staying home because he's contagious. But actually, he could put a headset on and still be part of that lesson. He doesn't need to be left behind. He can still have that same um, education. Imagine like the homework for talking or learning about ancient Rome is to put on a headset and actually visit ancient Rome. Just imagine like what that's going to be like in the future. So if this pandemic has taught us anything this year, it's that the future of VR should be accessibility. It should be that we start to look for these practical ways and these, I guess, beneficial use cases, you know, schools, um, hospitals, care homes. Imagine like all those uh, poor, like uh, kind of people left in care homes and weren't allowed to be visited by their families. I remember when my grandma um, went to a care home briefly. Um, it was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking that like, you know, I couldn't see her all the time or, you know, there, there'd been like a, an outbreak of like the flu or something. So you physically weren't allowed on the premises or all of those things. And you just feel helpless. Imagine if they could have like put a VR headset on my grandma and I could have put a VR headset on and we could have been together in a virtual space and she wouldn't have needed to have felt alone. And anyone that has listened to my TEDx talks know I talk a lot about my grandma in terms of she's, she's a massive inspiration to me for why I even kind of got into VR and why I kind of persisted with it and one of 
my core kind of driving passions, I guess, behind VR is the eventual use case for it. The, the fact that in future, less people will feel lonely, less people will, be, um, you know, be left behind because they aren't rich enough to have like an elite education or you know, every kind of person that goes into a new job will be able to learn and train in the way that makes sense to them, practical, real life. So they won't be left behind if they're dyslexic and they can't do the written test or they've got, you know, um, an attention disorder where they can't focus on like a, a, a video, a straight narrative video that's been playing to them. You know, there's so many, I just, I could talk about this forever because, there are just so many opportunities. So on, one, on the one hand, I don't know what the future holds for VR in 2021 because I feel like 2020, I have really lost touch with those end users, that, that kind of entry point for VR, which I used to so love doing. And I'm hoping that in 2021, we will start to see those come back. I don't think it will happen quickly. I think it's more likely going to happen in 2022 if there's a successful vaccine next year, I feel like the year after people will start to um, get back to their routines, wanting to go out and experience new things. They won't be as scared or um, cynical about putting a headset on their face. I also think that maybe not next year, but the year after we're going to see some of these early AR wearables like an apple glass or um something like project aria that facebook's working on maybe we'll see some kind of ar glass that comes out um, and is the first sign of like mass adopted ar glasses i think that's going to be a huge one for vr because when someone gets used to wearing a pair of ar glasses it's not as big a jump to then put on a VR headset. It will introduce a lot of people uh, into this kind of augmented world where we have digital and reality living alongside each other. And that's going to be really important for, for, for anyone working in the VR industry. So next year, I'm excited about, well, I'm going to be working on a couple of really cool projects next year, which I hope will be ready then to go to a, not a mass market, but the general public, like someone that isn't the kind of person necessarily to have a VR headset at home. I want to see more companies adopting VR as a really viable way to have like a virtual experience um, that is like additional to an in-person live event kind of experience. I know a lot of um, kind of my clients are exploring that already. They're having it as this you know, opportunity to do remote working or to have remote collaborations or to, to visit events that they can't physically be at. I think we're going to see more and more of that next year, hopefully. And more than anything, I just hope that the steam in which VR kind of had going pre-pandemic continues to kind of, steam is probably the wrong word, the fire, I guess, that was kind of, um, you know, roaring behind VR. Like we were, we were gearing up for another kind of wave of um, new VR kind of innovation, new people coming into the industry. And the pandemic kind of killed that a little bit because it removed that first time VR experience for a lot of people. So I'm hoping that by the end of next year, we'll start to see that come back. We'll start to see that momentum build again in 2022. I'm really hoping will be the year that we really start to see a real kind of uptake in all of the immersive kind of sectors. I think we're going to see some mad stuff in the next couple of years. So that's it from me today. That was a real rambly one, but I, oh, I just love this stuff. This, you know, when people ask me why I work in VR, um, it's not because of right now. In fact, a lot of the time I'm very frustrated with VR right now. I haven't put my VR headset on in at least a couple of months. <clears throat> You know, as a consumer, it doesn't appeal to me right now as a consumer. As someone working in this technology, though, I love using it in, in, in the jobs that I do, in the big narrative projects, in the big training projects, in the big kind of commercial things that I'm kind of involved with. I love seeing the potential of this medium. 
But for me, the exciting part and the bit that really kind of keeps me hanging in there, even when I'm like, oh God, it's so hard, (laughs) is that future, is thinking about what this looks like in 10 years time, is thinking about that whole cohort of students that if another pandemic happened in five years time, they would be so much better better off they would so they would be so much more better equipped because they would have this technology that would allow them to not only continue and kind of you know substitute their education but actually they'd probably be thriving it would make their education not necessarily better but it would be as good if not uh, already better because of the technology you know, so like going home and having the lesson is no different to being in the classroom and having the lesson. Do you know what I mean? Okay, I'm going to stop because I really am getting on my high horse. Those are what I think might be the trends for the next couple of years and especially next year. Those are also my thoughts on some of the ethics that we're exploring as we go into the future of immersive technologies. If anyone else is reading Ready Player Two, please let me know. Let's form a little book club or something. Let me know where you're at. I am pretty slow. Um, But I'm loving it so far and I'm sure any kind of VR nerd, you know, if you're like me, will love it too. Um, And there's loads of amazing like uh, philosophical um, ethical questions to kind of like pick at in this book so far and I'm only two chapters in. So let me know. Reach out to me, Instagram or Twitter, it's AlexMakesVR. Uh, If you enjoyed this episode or if you thought it was interesting or if you're just a fan of the podcast and you want to show your support, I would love it if you would share the podcast, whether that be with a a friend that you think might find it interesting or sharing it on your social medias and tagging me. It honestly makes my day. I've had so many beautiful DMs over the last week, um, kind of in response to my birthday, but have been lovely, lovely words about the podcast which just make my heart swell. And it makes me want to keep doing this. It lights a fire under my ass to be passionate about it. And I am, I'm super passionate about about this kind of stuff. Um, And I'm passionate about you guys. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for making 2020 less sucky by being on this journey with me. And let me know if there's anything that I can do for you to help you with your 2021. I know we're not there yet. I know there's definitely episodes... um, left in December so don't think you're getting rid of me just yet but I just want you to know that I am here for you we are all in this together have a great day wherever you are in the world and I will speak to you in the next one